First off, this story happened almost 10 years ago. I'll jump right in because it's long. I got home from work one day and logged into Facebook to find a message from someone I didn't know. It was too long ago to remember verbatim what was said, but it was along the lines of, Hey, I know you have no idea who I am, but I've been trying to decide what to do for a few days and I figured I would let you know what's been going on. Someone has been catfishing me using your identity for over two years, and I just found out about it last week. The sender of the email was clearly pretty shaken up and understandably was experiencing a mix of emotions. According to her, she had met the imposter online a little over two years prior to her writing this, and that they had been engaged in a pretty intimate, long-distance relationship for a majority of that time. The imposter had created a Facebook and had over time reposted almost all my photos with their own captions on them, including a good amount of art that I had drawn that they took credit for too. They created fake profiles for a good amount of my close family and friends though. They could comment on the photos of themselves to make the profile seem more legit. The funniest part to me is that although most things in my real life seem to be mirrored in this fake profile, I, a straight male, was instead portrayed as trans. I think the main reason for this was that the sender of the email and the imposter would actually speak on the phone, and the imposter turned out to be a female in the end, and therefore needed a reason to justify her more feminine sounding voice. The sender of the email was justifiably both angry and creeped out, and wanted to find the catfish. She started asking me a lot of questions about my life, but phrasing them like, Is your sister's name blank? And did you go to blank high school? Some of them were clearly information that anyone could glean from a quick browse of my profile. But then she asked, Is your best friend blank? Which struck me as odd since, despite this person actually being my closest friend, and who I spent the most time with, we have barely any Facebook photos together, and most are from a long time ago. And then she asked, Were you adopted, and are your half-siblings' names blank and blank? Which sealed the deal for me since I knew for a fact that I had never posted about being adopted online. The sender of the email already had an idea that this person had known me in real life, but this confirmed it for me. The sender of the email had contacted me shortly after confronting the imposter for the first time. My guess after two years... They had finally become suspicious of the fact that the imposter wouldn't show their face. I have no idea how long it took them to figure out that they were being played, but I'm glad they finally decided to give the ultimatum of show your face or I'm cutting you off. I'm pretty sure this is the point where the imposter admitted to being a catfish, and that she had been using the identity of someone she had a crush on in high school before hanging up. I was given the URL so I could look through the profile myself, which was up for about two days after I saw it before it was all removed. This was definitely really bizarre. The imposter had posted more than I ever had on Facebook, and it genuinely seemed like they had lived a pretty involved double life online as me. Almost everyone I had posted photos with in my real profile would have their own fake profiles created that had enough content to be convincing though they could be tagged in and validate these new photos. Some of these profiles seem to have gone and made their own real friends as well, and I wondered if any of those were used to facilitate even more online dating deception. Either way, the amount of time that this person had spent fabricating their alter ego's online presence, it was pretty shocking. The whole time, I had been crawling down the Facebook rabbit hole the sender of the email was looking through my real profile. After a while, she sent me a message saying, Did you take these photographs? And showed me what I remember as a black and white photo of a barn or something. I hadn't. Which was weird since everything else on the freight profile originated with me. And she had noticed the discrepancy. And we both tried reverse image searching with no luck. And then, either through a stroke of genius or somewhat suspiciously, I really couldn't tell, 
She thought to flip the fake number the imposter had written into the fake Facebook profile around in reverse. And a Google search came up with a landline that belonged to the home address of a girl that I had gone to high school with. Real me was Facebook friends with real imposter's profile. So we both went snooping around and found the photo that she had claimed I had taken. Which pretty much confirmed to me that this was the imposter. I'm pretty sure there were more indicators to the sender as well, but I can't remember. I thought about messaging her for a while, but decided that it probably wouldn't lead to anything good. At the time, my thoughts were definitely, let's not meet. I talked a few times with the sender of the email just to try and decompress a bit. But honestly, I just wanted to distance myself from the situation, and also had my suspicions about the sender as well. I figured maybe it was the imposter's last ditch effort to try and talk to me. Although when it was all over, the sender seemed to be eager to leave this all behind as well, so maybe not. Either way, it was a really strange experience. I felt mostly freaked out and violated, but I guess there was a small part of me that was flattered by it. I had a lot of mixed emotions. The weirdest part to me is that I'm a really approachable person and I would have definitely been willing to talk and probably be friends if this person had just approached me instead. Although, I'm still not sure if this was done out of an obsession for me, or if this person felt like I was just a suitable image to base the fabricated persona off of. I remember talking to her probably twice throughout high school, and really didn't have a very good idea of who she was other than a quiet hipster girl. If either person involved hears this, I would definitely be happy to talk now. It's been years, but I've gone from being very put off to always wondered why this person chose me over a myriad of other more attractive or interesting people online to base their other life off of. Now, according to the sender who had contacted me, she had probably spent more time online pretending to be me than she actually did going about her own life. I have a tumultuous history of addiction, and I have had plenty of my own escapes, which is why it's always fascinated me that someone would want to pretend to live someone else's life as a means of doing that. Because at the end of the day, the person pretending to be me had no idea that I spent my time daydreaming of being a different person as well. I guess it just goes to show that no matter how much you wish you were someone else, Chances are that person has plenty of their own reasons to want to escape their own demons, for their own reasons. For anyone still interested, I recently spoke to a good friend who told me that, while they don't know the perpetrator personally, they do know they identify as non-binary now, which to me sort of confirms my suspected motive, which was to explore their sexuality through another identity to one degree or another but I'll probably never know for sure. This was 2004 when I was 20 and living in a small two-level apartment on the main floor of a building. Out front, there were three stairs, then a deck, then three more stairs to the front door, and another little narrow deck that ran the length of the front of my apartment, which besides the door was all windows. The main floor was a tiny kitchen and living room, and a door to the hallway for laundry and parking access, all of which is totally visible from the windows. It was fall in western Canada during daylight savings, pitch black early and surprisingly warm for the season. I had all my windows open and hadn't closed the blinds as to get a breeze in, and I was talking on the phone to my sister. I had my back to the windows and when I turned around, I thought I saw something weird at the window. It was really bright inside, so I turned the main light off, and I see a man pressed against the window staring at me. I screamed and told my sister a man is on my deck looking at me. He seemed to take off into the darkness. I turned off all the lights inside, put the outside ones on, and I was babbling to my sister like holy crap, a peeping Tom, so scary that I couldn't believe it. And then he just walks back up to the deck. I screamed again. He's back. I have to call 911. I hung up and did. And while this face was pressed against the window, it was still open. 
The windows were floor to ceiling with screened crank open bottom sections that I had opened to the max and could for sure accommodate a determined person crawling in. He could hear me in the 911 call, but he didn't move. I had crouched down in the dark room and the main light was off, so he couldn't see me. But I had the lights on beside the door to the hallway and down these stairs to the bedroom. I didn't want to move and let him know where I was. I should have ran into the hall and banged on a neighbor's door. But I was in shock and after all the cops are coming from a station 10 blocks away, they gotta be here soon, right? The 911 operator said, We can't find your address. I'm directly behind the rec center at X and Y. Corner unit, unmistakable area landmark, in the only apartment building there. The man at the window starts banging on the glass. I was whispering, but I assumed he heard me give panic directions repeatedly, and we both can't hear sirens. They had felt like this would go on forever when he finally just ran off. I couldn't see far and there were plenty of places to crouch and hide, so I was not at all sure. I peek out to see a police car, so I told the operator that they're here. And then the car starts to drive away, and the operator told me to go outside and flag them down. I don't know why I actually did because I was scared out of my mind. But when I did, they rolled down their window. Ma'am, do you need help? Oh, you're looking for me, I think. I called 911. We're just driving, but what's your problem? They never found the man that terrified me and made me feel so unsafe that I moved. But it was truly the cops not being able to find me on the apartments behind a notable building that completely shook me. The frightening end note is when I moved out, they tried to charge me because the downstairs screens are shredded from your cats. The screens were pristine the day the creeper showed up. And that was the last time I opened the downstairs windows or blinds or used the front door. The property manager laughed and mocked me and called BS when I said someone cut them up until I showed her the police report. She lived there too, so it was suddenly not so funny. For context, I am 20 years old. I live in the suburbs and a small residence of six houses. My gate is very, very often broken, including today. That means about 80% of the time it is wide open, so everyone can fit into the small courtyard. My house has one floor and there are four bedrooms including mine, and downstairs there is a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment, the medicines are stored like morphine in doses that could really get you. And this is where the care takes place. I also have a dog, and I'm very, very close to him. He's a little bit of all my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen, to recognize the nurses who are arriving. He recognizes it by the sound of their tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks except when there is a problem. And finally, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is important for the story. That morning, like every morning, my nurse arrived at 8am. For the rest of the day, I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion of a painkiller. She replaces the antibiotic diffusers. She makes me a blood test and remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories with patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They have looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says to me, See you later. I'm sure that I'll be a little bit late, but don't worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning and I'm alone all day because my parents are working, except the nurses that pass by every four hours. Once I'm back from my meeting, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while, I hear the tire noises, and I get up because I think it's the nurse. But my dog has started to growl behind the door. I look at the time, 11.50 AM. 
uh, and tell myself that this is a bit early, but something instead of going after her. My nurse exchanges me with the patient from before her. I hear a knock at the door. Surprised, I gotta open it. Usually the nurses come in like that. And I see a young woman standing whom I've never seen before. She said to me, Hello, are you? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse is gonna be a little bit late, so she told me to come here and start preparing before she gets here. I wasn't wary at all. I was used to students coming in, but I'm just a little surprised that Sandra didn't warn me. Because usually, she warns me in the morning or she'll send me a message. And then she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we see each other. I tell myself that she must have just forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and I show her the way to the treatment room. She takes out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is being weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and he turns around to me. I was embarrassed so I left him in the living room and I closed the door to quiet things down. I really didn't care what she was doing. I just let her do it and I was on my phone at the moment. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally, we'll rinse my central catheter with a syringe of Phi serum already made. You just have to open the packaging. And there I see it's not a pre-made syringe but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see that my ampoules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened. Yet I hear the sound of ampoules breaking. I'm starting to think that this is weird. And there, she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? Oh my gosh. My blood is only one run for one spin. I got up and said, Um, I gotta go to the bathroom. It's happening. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs bathroom. The whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the bathroom. So I sent a message to my nurse. There is a student named Camille, don't worry. And then she replied, Who? I started crying in the bathroom and I was really, really scared. Camille, who came and said, Is everything okay? I think she could see that I was staying in there a long time. I said, Yes, yes, it's going to happen. And then I heard my front door slammed. Two minutes later, I hear it reopen, but I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me what had happened. I told her about it and showed the treatment room. So we called the police. They came, they examined, they took samples. The syringe and the rest of what Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. In the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man. And in the IV, it was a medicine to lower the heart rate. But it was so concentrated that it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who Camille is. And luckily, I never heard from her again. I specify that she did steal all the opioids, but no other things like my tablet which was on my bed or my computer, which was in the living room. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person didn't want me well, and I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student, and that my treatments are not like that. And I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. As for now though, I'm just going to try to stay vigilant and make sure I pay more attention to what is going on around me and I'll probably try to listen to my dog a little bit more as well. Animals always seem to know who's a good person or a bad person.